life has been crazy just wanna be okay how can i pick up the pieces when everything breaks with every day i'm getting older i feel the weight up on my shoulders i'm strong enough i'll rise above it's all gonna be okay if i can be anything i think i'm gonna be me Wednesday, Keely Dunn, FH Umpires. How are you all? Things are... Hi. I'm a little off center. I'm a little off kilter. I'm a little all the things. We have some major work to do today. It's a serious day at the Men's World Cup in India. Bhubaneswar Rukela, if I've said that correctly, I hope I have, has been going on for five days which means I have about 30,000 clips, 30,000 clips I could be going through. But of course, I'm not gonna be going through quite that many today. I think I've got about nine and I'm gonna try to, you know, I'm not promising a short show. I'm trying to just get through all of the things. And mm, my magic app is not working today. Oh, there it is. Let me just make sure it's gonna work now. Let's see, does that work? Does that work? Maybe not, but we'll figure it out because I need, I, oh, there it is, it did work. I need my magic app. See how I'm, I'm in two places at once? This is really freaky. I need that so that I can count players because it's pretty hard. And we don't seem to do a very good job of it for some reason. Let's see, is that gonna show up? Ladies and gentlemen, we are in business. Okay, let me see who's here nice and quick before we get into all of the topics. Because if I don't see all your names, I'm just going to assume I'm here alone. You know, just me. Hanging out, chilling. Oh, here's the comments. I can barely see him. Mr. Milford... 4D is here for the first time in so long. I'm so appreciative. I'm glad you're here. Scott Riley's here. Hi. And Luke is here. Hi, Jeanette. Good to see you. Rachel's got a rosé. And no, no, no. No, no, no. There's a moratorium after five days, Jeanette. You're not allowed to say it anymore. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I... I appreciate you. I adore you. But we've got to set boundaries around ourselves. Just saying, there you go. 
Neil's new name, the same person? Congratulations. Hope you're doing well. Kev is here. Good to have you. Ad, great to have you uh, from cold and you from from the cold Netherlands and there are no games tonight. You're snowed. That is very true with many people. Shane's moved into his new house, everybody. Yay! House party at Shane's. Everybody head down there. Unfortunately, it's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> joke Goddard's hi Richard good to have you let's see you of course is in the building the tech is working uh, shh, 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 shh. let's not anger the gods okay Mike Mack Raju nice I sir I believe this might be the first time we've seen you so wait my sound effects <laughs> hit that three times sorry Raju it's good to have you there we go and greetings to you there you go yeah too late right you have to be careful and Maxwell is here the man who won the quiz Kat was so mad at you Maxwell like I don't want to I don't want to start stuff but she was pretty mad anyway Hopefully the volume is good. My mic arm is doing really funky things. So it's not super close to me as it should be. And every time I try to bring it closer, you see, you see how it just moves. It just moves. Stop moving. Oh, I know what I'll do here. Watch this. This is MacGyvering friends there much better. Okay. Topics. Hi. We're going to go through an interception of aerials, which means many of them. Is this off the end line intentionally or not? Finally, ladies and gentlemen, a center pass call. What happens when an attacker goes in the net and scores a goal? A double yellow card. Too many players. Y'all know what I'm talking about there. And a hockey PC, which is a PC not for penalty corner, but for podcast. We're going to talk about all those things. So let's just, let's just get going. Let's get right into it. An interception of aerials. I've decided that this is what a plural is of an aerial. This is the first one that I wanted to bring to everyone's collective attention. This happened fairly early in the England Wales game. And if there is a poll to be had on this cat, feel free to slap one in that is about not necessarily the call. I mean, you can certainly, yeah, let's just do the call. That'll be fine. And yes, we are very, very busy. The yellow octagon. Yeah, we got all that going on for sure. So this one was interesting for you because I, I actually don't think there is much of a problem with this call. Um, I think everybody's pretty clear that the goalkeeper here is the initial receiver. He's at the top of his circle. He's ready to take that ball on the bounce. But a lot of people were interested in talking about what you as an umpire could be doing better in this situation to avert the collision. And what I want to say unto you all is actually there's nothing that you could have done better in this situation. We used to be coached on the regular that we needed to make this decision early. We needed to call it as soon as we could in the air in order to avoid collisions happening. So about that, now that players can intercept and that interception could happen quite late in the day, it could even be within playing distance of the initial receiver, so long as it is still safe. That means that we have to wait to see what's going to happen. So when you watch as this ball is moving on its trajectory, it's up in the air, it's dipping, it bounces on the ground, the aerial is still on. So if you've ever heard this urban myth that once the ball lands, it's no longer an aerial and it's everybody can go, no, that's not it. The aerial continues until it can be safely played. And what is safely played depends on the level. But what could have happened here is instead of 
And I mean, if you do, you, everybody here who plays tennis, put up your hands. Okay. In the last probably two decades, we've all learned about taking the ball on the rise and how fun that is. So instead of waiting for the ball to get to its apex off the bounce and then be falling back towards us, instead, you take the ball on the rise. And in tennis, it means that you get to hit the ball like way harder because it's coming at you hard in that moment. And it's pretty hard to time, but it's super dope. It, like your forehands just rip. Now, if Roper had, instead of waiting for the ball to bounce and then to rise and to be back up at its apex again, if he had cut closer to the bounce area, I guess the landing area, we can call it that way because the ball actually lands and took that ball on the rise, he would have been outside the five meters in the playing distance and all that sort of thing. So the umpire had to wait in this situation to see what Roper would try to do in this situation and couldn't call it any sooner. Now, I don't know if it's a viable skill to try to take a ball on the bounce like that. I have no doubt that we're going to start to see top players in the world be doing that soon because that's what they do. Top player things. They start innovating skills that we thought were impossible, that boggle our minds and delight our senses. And that's what this is going to be, taking the ball on the rise and that sort of thing. Okay, so hopefully that is pretty clear. I don't know if they're, um, yeah, I don't think we have a poll running. Thanks, Kat. Sorry, I was like trying to think that aloud as we were going. I'll go through your comments before we get to the next one. So no way this is going to be a single Kili hour. I don't know, Jeanette. I have a few that I think I'm going to run through pretty fast. But yeah, and there's a little clamp on the attacker stick. Like the Welsh keeper isn't just going to be like, sir, can I help you up? You know, come on. We're cool. And Raju, so I've been through all that thinking and I hope I've illuminated for you the reasons why that just isn't possible anymore. And that's the real risk of opening the rule up. Every time we've been trying to advance the way that this rule can operate and give the players more responsibility for each other's safety and to allow them to express their skill and do amazing hockey things, every time we make that kind of change, it puts umpires in a different position vis-a-vis -vis their timing, their interpretations, all that sort of things. And the things that we assume work for a previous iteration of the rule do not work for the newer. And it's our job to adapt. That's why we get paid the big bucks and we get hookers and blow. Just kidding. Okay. Uh, you heard a debate on whether Roper should have had a yell here. Uh, to you in the first instance, no, if it persists, yes. I mean, I, he's not, he's not breaking down the play. And if you want to get him for the physical reckless nature of the danger, yes, you could, uh, here in this moment, it would have been pretty silly and unnecessary. Okay. Remember, unless there's a danger element that we have to control, we're not going to try to, um, we're not throwing cards for things that don't break down the play. Okay, Wales were not on attack here. The ball was a, a pass from an England player. And unfortunately, you know, it was trying to head to the space, but because of Roper's line, he was too far outside. If he had been running up the middle of the pitch, he actually probably would have gotten it. And... That doesn't break down something good that Wales is doing in that moment because they have possession of the ball and they're attacking. Okay, so Simon, I hope that helps with the distinction there. Why we're not doing that. So let's see. There you go. Yeah, no poll. Sorry. <laughs> it, uh, there's a lag, cat. You know there's a lag. Nobody who plays tennis can put their hand up because they have tennis elbow. <laughs> ha! Mm. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, it. to be fair to Raju, I mean, when the, uh, I think it was the opening match of the World Cup, the graphic went up and it said referees and I just, I don't know, like somebody punched a kitten in that moment because I was really, I was really sad. It's all good. Remember, he's new. Like, let's be nice, guys. Okay. 
There you go. You get hocus and blow. They try to hook the sticks and obstruct and you blow it. Oh, boy, Luke, you're on fire tonight. Stop. Just kidding. If Roper had moved left forwards, he would have been able to play the ball outside the circle. Yep. And it would have been a great play. So, but this is, this is a hard skill. <laughs> like when, when Roper comes back to let's stick together, I hope he doesn't have to come on and say, you know, that lot from FH umpires, those third teamers, they're, they don't know, they don't know anything because this is a really tough thing to do. No ropes. I get it. This is hard. This is a hard skill and you are in that zone of learning stuff. So thank you very much. Okay. We'll just move right on to the next because it is a busy day. Here was the next aerial interception I wanted to show off and it's from the same game. And this is important because we need to see what the opposite side of the interceptions are and what the, the next fallout is going to be. Okay. I understand that it's not clear who is the initial receiver, so for me it's a free out. We are asking a penalty corner for five meters. So what we're looking at here in this moment is that there's an attempted interception by a Welsh defender the ball falls to the attacker, for the, to the English attacker, Banarak, and the Welsh defender then plays the ball. So the question is, is this an infringement of five meters? How do we calculate this? How do we put this all together? Okay. If the Welsh player is the initial receiver, then the Welsh player is actually the one who gets to play it, but he missed it, and then the ball falls. The, the next initial receiver is the English player. So you can look at it that way, or you can look at it that Banarak was the initial receiver, and the Welsh player attempted but failed that interception. What is that defender then expected to be able to do, expected to do? It would be pretty harsh to ask them to disappear. Okay, we're definitely not asking them to disappear. However, once he's missed that ball, at this moment he has a choice to jump in and attempt to play the ball or to step back and allow the initial receiver that he failed to intercept the five meters in order to control the ball. Okay, so this was a really, really interesting referral. I can absolutely see in the moment why Herman made the call that he did. It's, it's one of those instinctive, like, you know, which way it goes and you could potentially claim this is a mishandle of the the ball by Badnarak and so you say well he mishandled it so we're going to play on however at the moment that he mishandled the ball he was being infringed on the five meters the attempted interception was within five meters however it wasn't playing distance and it was safe okay so we're going through all these steps ball's going up initial receiver is is an attacker Defender within five meters, but outside playing distance and the attempted interception is safe. And note, I've been, I've been really hammering on this point that the attempted interception is above his head and he's reaching up. So he's at the higher point of the trajectory. That's very safe. He doesn't reach a stick into the playing area that surrounds the face, the body of the initial receiver. That's why it's safe. The initial, the, the interception fails. The ball then goes to the initial receiver. Had that interceptor been outside five meters and the attacker plays it towards him on the mishandle, I'd be like, yeah, play on. He doesn't get an extra few meters in which to corral that ball, but he did need the, but the, the defender who failed because he was trapped within that five meters because he failed that interception, he needed to leave that alone. Let me see what your comments are. Oh, Roar. Yeah, maybe. There's lots of great receivers of aerials out there. Simon, you think it's worth saying Rappaport's been brilliant on video on the pitch so far? Um, well worth watching him in these tournaments. Yeah, he's been very good. He's especially good in the booth. He he reminds me of, of Bruce Bale 
and he ha he's I mean he's a lawyer hi lawyers tend to be really good at these things because we like rules we remember them and we we've been trained how to step through and analyze and synthesize the information so that's one of the things and he's he's very very good at that and it's a pc pc for godders hi sebastian glad you're here uh welsh defender was at, at the absolute limit of being able to intercept yep full extension did his best pc for stain as well has to be given time to bring the ball under control on the ground i know that's what the rule says on the ground but we see repeatedly at higher levels of play that players do not to have the ball they do not have to have the ball on the ground in order to be controlling it they can control very well by corralling the ball in midair and 3d skilling it off so i'm not applying on the ground if that's what the player can do if they're in full control there i'm gonna let somebody come in and tackle end of story so I don't use, I, I don't include that phraseology. It's archaic and it doesn't apply to how the game is being played these days. Elsa B is here. Excellent. And a penalty stroke. <laughs> He's made up his own hashtag. Oh, you're so cute. And you're early. I wouldn't say that's, I, I think that's harsh to call that as an intentional or reckless as to knowing that you're going to break down the play because of how quickly it happens and that the intent to intercept was completely fair. So we're not penalizing him for trying to intercept the ball. We're penalizing him for failing to step back once he failed to intercept the ball. And that happened really, really fast. So that's pretty tough. In slow-mo, it looks a lot more, it looks a lot more controlled than it was in the moment. So that would have been tough. Yep, Simon, absolutely. Uh, Banarak knocked the ball forwards, but still within the playing, his playing distance, but within, but the defender's playing distance as well. Had, had the defender been, uh, Kirikidis, I think is his name. Um, if he had been five meters away at that moment, if the attempted interception had been five meters away, Banarak plays it, I'd expect to like instantly because he doesn't have control, but he was never given the five first. The, the, the five had to be given first, okay? Hi, Tristan, good to have you. You play on for you, but you understand the point of a PC if you're calling that you can live with it. I'm glad you can live with it because I don't want this to be the hill you die on. Alistair, can you argue the attempted interception is illegal? However, the attacker is the initial receiver and then you play by the rules of PC. Uh, that's exactly what I just argued. So yes, you can. Yep. Gut feel there, Rachel. Excellent. Kev, PC not given time to bring the ball into control. Yep. There you go. Okay. We will, you know what you can do, Sebastian, is you can take the scroller, you can take the, the, um, the play bar at the bottom and you can pull it all the way forwards. Put me on two times speed or 1.5. If you think I talked too fast and then you can catch up to the live broadcast. I know how to do these things. Eloise, the interception was safe. Attacker receives the ball uh, when the ball is almost on the ground. Takes it cleanly. Play on. No. No, because the five meters wasn't given. So, good try. Okay, last one of the interception of aerials. It's an interception of it. It's a cluster. Ooh. And a quickly take it. And here's a chance for cover. Yes. Scores! Blake he hits the ball very, very hard. When he gets the chance in the circle, he smacked it. Perfect. Look at, look at the pace with which he hits this. He has time and the goalkeeper. So first, I'd just like to address that it's definitely a five-minute yellow for the, uh, the stash and the mullet. Okay. Uh, now that we've gotten that out of the way, just a, a few things that I want to cover off on this because I didn't, um, the first time I saw it, there was a lot of, a lot of things that you want to take into account. So if you're in this position and you're seeing a play uh, develop like this, 
the first thing that you're making sure, and this is why you're going to be proactive when you're out there, is that you're going to make sure that that five meters is initially given. Okay. You have to register that, register that in your mind. Don't just be a passive sort of recipient of this, uh, of this incident. You're going through your checklist at every single free hit that you've called. And the, the first step is, is the, am I happy with where the ball is? Now the ball isn't right on the 15 meters and I can't remember exactly it could have been that a free hit was given and it wasn't a 50 meter restart for the ball being played over the end line. So that could very well be valid. But once that, once you're happy with that ball placement, that's step number one. Step number two is where am I going to be happy with the players, uh, on the opposition being five meters away? Where is the five meters? And if you look, let's see if I can freeze this at a good opportune moment. It's not going to be easy, but friends, I'm not here for the easy stuff. I'm here to, to, I'm here for the challenge. Okay. This works out pretty well. So what we're looking at here is, is whether this distance here is five meters. And for me, I think it is the, I should actually turn on the layer. Is it going to work? Is it going to work? Okay, so the five meters there, it's off at an angle. So even though Govers is in front of the 23, the ball is starting. Oops, let's just clear all this off. The ball is starting behind the dotted line here. Okay, so on the offset, and given that we have camera angles and all that kind of stuff, I'm happy that this is five meters away. It's it's not really easy for us to tell entirely, but that's fine. And then what happens is it's a misplay of the aerial and it strikes Govers in the body. Okay. So it's not like he takes that ball cleanly on the inter intercept with his stick. He actually plays it with, come on now. I can't even get my, um, can we get this playing again, but I will in a second. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. There it is. So when that ball is played dangerously at the defender, he's five meters away. And if you hit or you present danger with that aerial on the way up, that is going to be the defender ball. And then because it's hit him in the body, you can't simply just play a free hit needs to be taken by, you know, the player that's been struck with the ball. So the next question I looked at was, was the ball sufficiently stopped for that time in that context in order for it to continue to play? And my conclusion was yes. And it's not super easy to see with the angles that we have, but when you watch the replays, the ball falls pretty darn dead off his body. And there's no question that the self pass is taken right from that moment. There's no question that the only player who is involved in that is the Argentinian who tried to lift the aerial in the first place. He, he is well within five meters. He cannot play the ball. He is not disadvantaged. So when you apply the criterion, as I went through very laboriously during the Commonwealth Games and that infamous England-Australia semifinal goal, this is absolutely a legally taken free hit in my view. So that's where I sort of worked through it there. Um, let's see. You're at the theater, William, you fancy this. This was a great William, you fancy this. This was a great game. This, this was very exciting. And one of the, one of the more intriguing games, uh, so far, for sure. If you all start a five meter from the ball, then you're fine. If not, then that was the first foul. That's correct, Rachel. So 
Um, Mark Cummings and you had a similar one to the band rack aerial on Sunday. Yeah, you agreed the opponent coach chose that as the one incident to take with issue with after the game. And that's okay, right? So like reframe it for yourself, Simon, that this is a really great opportunity for you to go through a scenario that you haven't had to go through prior to the rule change at the beginning of this year. So people don't know how this is gonna, gonna work. And you get to explain it to them and you get to show them and say, oh yeah, absolutely. I can see what your concerns are, but here, let me explain how this works. And this is what, you know, these are the interpretations we're applying, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, this actually is the correct result. I hope that helps you going forward because we're going to see lots of these and maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Yeah. Luke thinks it's five from a top view. Um, might have been a better idea for the defender to get with the PC by tackling covers within the five meters. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. If he had done that, he would have been sitting with at least a five minute yellow, if not a 10 because of the time of the game. So this was the, the play that tied the game up for Australia. Uh, Argentina had surprised everybody by even be, being, okay, I was probably the only one who was super surprised that they were even within touching distance, but to be leading the number one ranked team in the world by a mile from them. You see, there's only two minutes left. So yeah, this would have been, it would have been Dan's easiest uh, yellow card ever in the history of the world. And giving up the PC there might've been a good idea, except Hayward has been bombing it in this tournament. So yeah, hard to say. Yeah, going by shadows, like we're making all these calculations and at the end of the day, I was down and I'm pretty sure he would have called it if he needed to. You didn't spot the body contact, so change of mind. Cannot play on from that. Two wrongs don't make it right. Don't recall hearing the whistle though. And it was, it was difficult. There was a lot of sound and cheering and things like that, but Dan had his arm out. So whether he blew the whistle or not, I'm assuming that he did. Not clear in the initial video that he was hit on his body from the top down. It looks like the perfect time for a quick free hit attack, removing the aerial taker from the defense. Well, well explained, Luke. That's exactly right. So remember, we're looking at this from what will we do when this happens to us? And this does happen to us. We have a lot of players who attempt aerials and don't do so safely and can't get the ball up and over. And so we have to go back. So... So there you go. Kev, you would have plowed him down. I would have too. Absolutely. I would have. If I could get close enough. Oh, that's not a risk of a yellow card. That is a guarantee of a yellow card. An absolute guarantee for the high impact on the game. Plus there had been many cards. Plus this was in the last almost two minutes of the game. So there you go. Okay, great stuff, gang. Those were the aerials that I particularly wanted to illuminate for you. There were, um, there's been a ton. <laughs> hey, it's the World Cup. There's a lot of aerials and a lot of discussions in the playing and coaching ranks about, about it. If you see one that uh, on a, uh, in a match when you're watching highlight reel on the socials, do get in touch with me, Keely Dunn of FH Umpires. Um, DMs are okay right now because I know people are really excited and sometimes they're referring to things that they're seeing on socials, but the best way to get a hold of me and the entire community, because I don't just do this alone, I do this with all of you, is to come onto the FH Empires Discord server, fhempires.com forward slash, I'm not elocuting very well today. Mm -mm -mm dot com forward slash ds that is uh where you will find all of the conversations and i can get into more detail with people so i've been trying to people have been dming me with questions especially when they're not about the world cup right now but they're about maybe something about indoor and i'm like hey i'd love to answer you but i don't have time to do this just a one-on-one -on -one conversation we need to get the whole community involved please come into the server because sometimes your question is something that we have some really, really great smart folks in there and they can help you even faster than I can. And then I'll pop in with my little maple leaf emoji and be like, that's perfect. Thank you very much for your assistance and we can move on. So I would really appreciate it. 
there you go jack jack thinks there's a pretty loud whistle in there and there you go so yes and that's another way you can get into it if you write discord out i've got like about four pretty urls that will direct to the discord so that's all fine and the defender stopping makes you feel like there's a whistle and that's again that's the advantage of using that whistle instead of just playing the advantage there's no ambiguity there and it and it it has an impact on what the defenders do so don't be shy there you go um 37 watching and 12 likes thanks for the statistical update shane what are we going to do about that yes we are i can see there's a couple thumbs coming in so please do jump in there and give us a like if this is giving you value and get in the comments get in everything okay was this ball off the end line intentional or really not well the the this is the last england clip i promise <laughs> okay captain america as the guys from the hockey pc are, have called him i'm sure not for the first time i'm sure steve's heard that one before England would like to know if it's a um, deliberate hit over the back line, please. Yep. Oh, 216 left. Did he receive the ball? Did he have any opportunity to try and play the ball out? Along the so I'll let line? you just take or a gander at this. Not? Maybe, Kat, this can be our first poll. Was this a PC or was this a 23 meter restart, as was called? Right. He's reaching outside his left, isn't he? It was a penalty corner. So in this scenario here, the ball is played inward the circle he's running in there's no pressure there's only himself so i don't know well that is it if he, oh, if he has the opportunity to put a stick on it and get it clear oh i mean that it'll be really I harsh i think i'd feel pretty harsh if It'd i was given harsh. against me steve director i have a decision steve yes no clear reason to change your position yeah i think that's corner. the right decision on corner okay so this is late in the game two minutes 30 seconds left and a well-taken referral um by england definitely would take it any day of the week and that sort of thing and i'm interested in hearing what you guys think about this before i get into any of it whatsoever um obviously this is these referrals are the most difficult because they involve applying all the subjective factors that we're looking for in determining the difference between a penalty corner, which to be fair, England hadn't really been putting any away, so maybe it wasn't that big of a deal, and a 23 meter restart. Still a massive call and a massive swing instead of just trying to figure out whether a ball has hit a foot or there has been a stick obstruction or there has been a back stick. Those are lovely and much more objective, even though they're not entirely objective, a lot easier to determine, I think, in this case. So there you go. Uh, so for Simon, it's a, it's a PC for you. You could have controlled it and moved it sideways, you think. Uh, Goddard, you saw it live and you thought it was a PC. What about the free hit out for the attacker on the obstruction backing into the player? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think there's a shield there at, at all, Jolt. It's, it's, it's a good, you know, it's a good question to ask, but that player, that attacker is entitled to change direction and move and spin. I don't think he backs into the defender at all. The defender, you know, isn't even really making an, an engaged attempt after the first. So as we're watching, um, I can't remember what this guy's name is, coming in, so as soon as the player curls, as soon as the defender manages to get around in front at that point, the player curls and he's curled away. He's not backing into him. He's not continuing movement that way. He's entitled to curl around him like that. Now, if he had stayed with the ball in, in one position vis-a-vis -vis their bodies and then started stepping backwards, totally different story. Those need to get called. They need to be called more often, but I feel that it's, um, it's good. Okay, so Raju, you're, you're feeling that it's not deliberate. The defender was caught on the wrong foot. And for me, this is what, when I saw the replay, my gut in the moment did go PC because I'm following the movement of the ball. 
But when I watched the replay and I saw that the Indian defender had to move his stick from his strong side to where he's expecting that ball is going to get slipped, right? I mean, we know hockey. At least this is how I coach everybody I coach to play and how I wish I would play better is to drive right down to the baseline. You're along the baseline and then you slip the ball back because it's one of the hardest plays to intercept and it's a great spot for your attackers to get to. And considering where whoever that is, I don't know if that's Roper or whatever, considering where all the other players are, you wouldn't have expected that ball to try to get fed straight through there. He's on his strong side. And when you're not watching in slow motion, when you're watching in real time, he has to move his stick from the right-hand side of his body in front to his left in order to make contact with the ball. So his stick appears to be moving in that direction. Or not appears, but it is moving in that direction. But is he moving in that direction in order to play the ball in that direction or just to get a touch on it? That is the question there. Anywhere else in the field he controls that ball, he is good enough. I, I think that's harsh. Add, it looks like he mishits the ball. Could be a 23 meter. Simon, he's under no pressure and could have controlled the ball. It's a cop out um, to put the ball off the back line. Now, the first part of that sentence is good rationale. The second part of that sentence is throw away garbage. So we're not even going to, you know, like that is just circular logic. And I really want to push you guys on your critical thinking and presentation skills, because this will help you explain to players much more effectively when you're on the pitch in your own decision-making. It's really important to be able to talk through these things concisely, accurately, and in a way that is actually meaningful. So the first part of that is to say he's under no pressure. Well, he's not marking a player under, uh, under those circumstances. So that is one of the factors that I lean the other way. To, towards this being intentional. So that is a good spot. Tristan, there might also be some England bias going on as well. Yeah. Uh, from many, potentially. Uh, Mike Farmer, it's a PC for you. Left elbow straightens out face, straightens face, after which he then rotates the face to the byline. B bit blurry though, to be sure. And that's the biggest problem, I think, with this footage and what we're watching is that we, the camera is moving right at the moment when the defender uh, makes contact with that ball. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot tougher to see. I think if we had a really sharp picture, I'd feel a lot more comfortable in, in, in feeling as though we'd go against it. So we're looking at things like, you know, where was you know, what was the movement of his stick and whether that if he turns the, the face of his stick so that the ball is definitely going off that end line or if he's moving his stick across his body very quickly in order just to get in front of it, does he make full contact? Does he sort of edge the ball off the stick? We can't see those things from this footage. We can't. Don't even try to tell me because it's not true. And the fact that he's stationary, you know, is he, and, but he's not under a lot of pressure that goes in and, and pressure being like an actual, another player, like right next to him, trying to reach over to him. Kev, uh, he has room and time along with the skill level to put the ball in some other direction. And that's, that's the, you know, does he have time? Isn't this late in the match? You can't say there's no pressure. That's another point on the other side of it, Joel. And, and just knowing, <laughs> knowing where it is in this match to say that a defender who is standing in front of their goalkeeper doesn't know if there's somebody right behind him. Like he doesn't know that there isn't a player that is about to grab that ball if he misplays it in any way, shape or form. That's a little harsh. And being a defender, I'm looking at this going, yeah, I, I would feel a lot of pressure in this situation. So Maybe feeling pressure isn't the right way to look at it. Maybe those those aren't the right terms for us. Okay. Um, ben, your thoughts aren't biased for England. I know. I didn't I didn't accuse you of that. I was talking about the English people here. 
Um, and Captain America was absolutely well positioned. Absolutely. And a comment that I made, uh, this was uh, Steve's second game of the tournament, and I thought he was outstanding. He was my he was my pick for umpire of the day. Um, he had a very good first game, and I was uh, I was pleasantly impressed. Uh, he definitely stepping it up a level that I haven't seen from him, and then really followed it up in this game. Him and did he have Marson on the other side? I think he did. Yeah, Marson was on the other side. Also had a fantastic game. So this was a really good game to watch from an umpiring perspective. So. And yes, and Goddard's this this is sort of the ultimate wrap up on this is that it's a difficult call to all overturn on the field, because w when you see this in slow motion, you completely change your mind, don't you? Like you just at a slower pace, you think, oh, look at that motion, you know, all that kind of stuff. It look it looks like he's moving in that direction. Our perception is absolutely manipulated by the solar speed. So let's keep that in mind. Okay, two minute warning. Let me see what the poll results are. Oh, that sounded kind of a little loud. I hope that's not blowing eardrums out. Let's see. No, I don't know what you're seeing. You're seeing my loop back. Don't ask me. I'll fix it in a second. Just, just give me a hot minute. Give me a hot minute. This is always the worst part of it. There. 61% of you wanted a, a penalty corner and a 23 meter restart for 38% of you. Totally understandable. Um, I, I, I can see that, but you, you, you know, that in the moment at the pace, and with that view, I almost think that if there was one thing that Steve maybe could have done there was to actually take a step back and be a little further away because then you can open up your peripheral vision so you can see that even better. And maybe that wouldn't have changed anything in that moment, but think of you in your matches. Is that an adjustment that you can make that'll help you just have more awareness of what that defender actually does as that ball's being crossed? I think that'll really help you you know, pinpoint this decision, but yes, in the, in the moment, the, the, the subjective decision needs to be made and it's got to be clear. It's got to be a, a very clear reason to change the decision away from the 23 meter restart. So there you go. Uh, I appreciate all of your, uh, your thoughts on this. Um, let's see. When England, you loved what Steve did when England pushed on the elbow and explained the no referral. Okay, yeah, that was that was early in that match. Just maybe a couple minutes before, there's a little bit of a coming together between two players that we didn't see on camera. And sorry, we just got the horn blowing for time. So I'll just explain this one really quickly. I, I went back through the footage to see if I could, you know, detect it better and the cam the the directorial decisions just aren't there and it would have been reviewed by the td as to whether there was an off the ball elbow push trip whatever it might have been in that moment and it would have been looked at guaranteed so the fact that i haven't heard anything come out of that tells me that there wasn't anything to to examine but i'll keep an eye out maybe i didn't look in the right places to see where that was happening but anyway yes that happened around the middle of the park in fact it was even behind the center line and then the play continued in towards uh, the Indian circle and then Steve had to take a couple seconds and explain and and his his response to the English players was very empathetic might have been a little bit even too empathetic he said yeah it's stupid we can't we can't look at it we're just not allowed to and, you know, it'll get looked at is what he said is it'll get looked at. And he's absolutely right. That's, that's the way to do it. So just keep that in mind out of that sort of thing. Yeah. Deliberate elbow in the midfield is what they were looking for. Uh, yeah. Um, no, he, what, what he meant to say is that, that the technical team will look at it. Not that there's a change coming in the referrals because, uh, they would be really hard pressed. 
to do that. And if they do it, they're doing it after the World Cup and not before the World Cup because changing rules beforehand is a bad idea. Okay, how are we doing? Not too bad. That's four clips. And this one's gonna be really fast. Ladies and gentlemen, a center pass call. Australia, Argentina. Australia. Get this. Oh, the mess of that. I think this was Dan oh, and Martin. They did get the second half underway, but have given away the free hit. So for all of you oh, armchair so umpires at home who are always demanding, always saying, come on, umpire. Yes, we have ourselves a bit of an issue here with this player having broken into the attacking half prior to the ball being played. Free hit awarded, ball turned over to Argentina. Everybody's happy, ladies and gentlemen, a center pass decision. Yay. Okay, that's all I have to say on that one. That's it. Let's move on. Attacker in the net. <laughs> This was in uh, match two, Australia and France. There's the upright reverse pass, knocked across. Brand, yes, and Tom Craig tapped it in on the reverse. Tom Craig making sure, as all good forwards do, Brand couldn't quite get it into the goal. Craig made sure good teamwork from Australia. Made sure getting a couple of comments in there. Oh, you guys. Okay, I'll go back to it. Was that four? Okay, so Tristan, legitimate question. Has it affected play? Not at this moment. But you know what they're about to do? Australia. He's jetted off down yeah, yeah. into the other end. The play is that this player here is going to bomb big over top and hit that player in the circle. It's a set piece. They're trying to do that. He's trying to get a head start. It was going to lead to something. So I can understand why it was called in that moment because once the ball has gone down into that end, it's too late. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why the decision was made. Okay. Oh, there it is, Tom Craig. Has he got it? Tom Craig. Yes, Ben Burton. the upright reverse pass, knocked across. Brand, yes, and Tom Craig tapped it in on the reverse. Tom Craig making sure, as all good forwards do, Brand couldn't quite get it into the goal. So let me know your thoughts on this. Hole can be... Is this a goal or a free hit defense for the attacker being inside the net? Because, let's see if I can Can I do this? I seem to be struggling with my controls here. I wanted to be able to show you the actual rules, but I cannot. Essentially playing the sweep of that. Oh, there it is. Tom Let's go to the replay screen here. But the rule is that a player cannot enter the net, his opponent's net. So do you have a problem with this? Yes or no is what I'm interested in. What they've done, Tristan, is that they have gone, like they have already committed the foul. The advantage of committing the foul hasn't manifested yet. That is the difference. So it, this is why this is such a hard thing to try to call in the moment. But it's absolutely properly done. So they have done the thing. They have committed the foul. It just hasn't paid off yet. 
Okay, so on this one, you you feel like it should only be called if it disadvantages the defense, which it didn't for you. So goal, it's 914. Thank you, Rachel. All of you at home should be able to have a copy of the rules of hockey on a PDF or the app, if that's the best way for you, on hand whenever we're doing these What If Wednesdays so you can check my work. Check my work and make sure that I'm not making up rules. Check your own understanding. You're saying, well, I know there's a rule against the attacker going into the net. Is there? Make sure. Check the wording. Read the rule. So, Niels, this is the distinction, okay? The disadvantage is not that a decision was made in their favor. The disadvantage is they couldn't do something because of the foul occurring. They couldn't play the ball. They couldn't... Um, they couldn't make a tackle. They couldn't complete the pass. They couldn't do something else. Not that an award was given. That is not what advantage is. Okay. And a lot of people get that confused. A decision made is not the advantage. Because otherwise, every time somebody could say, well, if you don't call that foot in the middle of nothing, they get the advantage of it not being a foul called against him. It's circular logic. Okay. Is it intentional? It's, yeah, it's not intentional. That's for sure, Stain. Um, Joel, the attacker was staying in a legal place and played the ball into the goal. Free hit defense for you. Yeah, it's not even that, Yoop. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very, uh, yeah, it's, it's like, the philosophy of logic, but definitely not. Okay. So for me on this play, hopefully everybody's voted. This is a goal because absolutely nothing changes. There is no de defender who can't intercept that ball, who can't mark that player, who can't play the ball because of where the Australian player is the rule against being inside the net. What's the purpose of it? What's the principle we're applying is that if they're inside the goal, they are creating a problem for the goalkeeper. They are distracting them. They are potentially in their way. They're obstructing them from behind. None of that's happening here. The goalkeeper is well out of position. They're, they're baked and caked. They're done. So absolutely nothing turns on this. I don't love when we have to make these kind of decisions on, let me blow the two minute warning because I don't think there's too much to talk about on this. So I'm not a big fan of us having to make these kind of decisions on such big moments like goals. And sorry, don't just, just focus. This is the last one. I'm going to get this poll up these poll results up as soon as it pops into my folder. There we go. Which is which I have to call the, I have to close the PC one there. Does that work? There we go. Okay. So for how many, 66% of you, you were cool with this. And so a third of you still wanted the free hit defense with 24 votes. And I can understand that. I think there's a difference between spotting things and making clever decisions and doing the right thing for what actually occurs in the game. And for me, there's nothing disadvantageous like that you just like we're not calling a foul for a player being outside of the field normally only if it disadvantages the opponents makes them think it's a substitute player or something that's that's a good analogy that is definitely a, a similar situation there the rule says they mustn't intentionally enter the goal and i do not believe he did however he was in a position to play the ball and score without obstructing the defense exactly so that's good that's i, I like how you piece those two things together luke thank you Mike, your only question would be something along the lines of the defense don't need to follow the player to the goal because he can't legally score. 
like offside. Yes. And again, I don't think a defender was in that kind of position. So that's another ground, another factor that you might look at. So thanks for pointing that one out. I like that a lot. Thank you. And that's time. That's time. Okay, are we on five or are we on six? I think we're on six. Hang on. If I press the same timer thing, no, we're on five. I almost skipped it. I almost skipped the double yellow. So this was quite, an, in front of his man. I knew this was gonna be a fascinating game and it sure was. This is Malaysia, Chile. This is in the second quarter as you can see from the clock. Earlier on. Now whistle's gone here. What's the umpire seeing? He's sending someone off. Let me and get my physical. big head out of the way. Off the ball challenge. So hopefully you're not listening to anything that's being said by the commentator because he's got no clue what's happening. Suspension. This is a double green card for some misconduct in front of her man there. And he does this one. Okay. That's him indicating two green cards for there was just a couple of one each player in, on the team. In the, in the first we're now winding down the third quarter and we're in Ben Gunchen's end. Chilean defense. Converts in possession stats as well that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Malaysia with 54%. We're off the ball, the nothing's happening around the ball quarter. and he stops time. Seeing a card there too as well. Now this might change the rhythm of things. And again, the commentator still fail, fails and the direction doesn't help at all. Just focusing on one of the players running off the pitch instead of both of them. A double yellow is given for misconduct. One of those two players that we don't see on screen is Amoroso. The Chilean drag flicker. And then we're here. Not five in my opinion. Umpires believe that to be true as well. And a green card for breaking down the play. I was just going to say, Chile is, you know, I've got and there goes Amoroso again. Herman initially and gave a green card and, well and then realized that it needed to be a yellow, and that card was given well. for the five meter infringement on the aerial. So, what you had was the same player in this match receiving two yellow cards in the game. So, Poll, <laughs> is two yellow cards sufficient or correct here? Or did the player need to receive a red card? And I don't care if you call it a technical red, okay? Keep in mind, England, that that is your terminology. It doesn't apply in South Africa. It doesn't apply in Canada. It doesn't apply anywhere else in the world. It's the term that you guys use under your regulations for conduct that is deserving of a yellow card but because an earlier yellow card has been given the red card is awarded okay that's your term so i can translate but we got to know that that's where it is okay let me know what you think reju two different offenses question mark and that's what's at the heart of this for me. I don't know. I, I'm a little concerned at the fact that the first option for that particular play, I don't think there had been a five meter infringement that needed an intervention earlier in this game or that should have been given. But we are in Q4. We have Chile who is you know, the, it's a one goal game. It's very tight. There's only five minutes left to call this a low impact offense is, you know, I, th I think that's kind of sh shaving it a little bit. I think this for any player very well could have been a yellow card just right off the bat. So I just want you to sort of understand where I'm coming from, from that. Could the second yellow have been a yellow card 10 minute? It was quite a different offense. It was a 10 minute yellow card. Okay, so once once he came back, he did that and then he did what is 
in some places accepted as the signal for 10 minute. I prefer this. I don't prefer putting your hand up in the air with your fist. It's that can mean very, very different things in different cultures. Uh, only if it's the same offense twice though. So if you go back to any of the probably six times I've discussed this concept on what up Wednesdays is that you get yourself into a lot of trouble when you start slicing some hairs here about what a different offense is, because I can break the, the play down by committing an intentional stick foul. I can also break the play down by interfering with five meters. I could interfere with five meters using my feet and just putting my body in the way, or I could interfere with five meters from, for reaching by my stick, reaching by my stick, by reaching with my stick. Are those different offenses? To me, if you are breaking down play in any of those ways, if you are time wasting, if you are using your stick, if you are using your body, if you are interfering with five meters, all of those things are breakdowns and a player who has already been penalized with a yellow card for that broad category of offenses should not be returning to the pitch. This is irregardless of any regulations that you may have in your area about mandatory bans. I don't care. Okay. That's your own problem. That's administrator problem. But does that player have the right to come back onto the pitch and continue playing after they have cheated so much twice in a game? To me, no. This is one of those very small exceptions. Very, very limited exception because what you had was a misconduct off the ball and we didn't even see what happened. The two players could have been yelling at each other and just calling each other names. We don't know what happened here. Okay. We, we, we don't have eyes on the situation. They may have been pushing and shoving each other, that sort of thing. That is not conduct that impacts on the play in the moment. It doesn't disadvantage one opposition or another. The two players are being jackasses and they get tossed. End of story. The next thing that Amorosa does is he breaks down the play with a five meter. That is two for me, significantly different enough offenses. It's so rare, but this is the one time you can do it. One of the few times you can do it. But I'm telling you, if you're giving two yellow cards for breaking down play to the same player and not giving them the red, you are not doing your job and you're not giving it because you're afraid of giving red cards. Now I talk all the time about blatant breakdowns of plays that everybody else calls just demands for red cards for, and I call absolute bullshit on it because it's, it doesn't fulfill our criterion for red cards, but when a player has already taken a yellow, where are they in the game? Where is their headspace? What are they doing? What are their intentions towards the game? Are they going to come back on and just do something again? Yes, they are. And that's why they don't get to play anymore. In my view. Let me find out what y'all are saying here. So Mike, the, 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 the umpiring team would have gotten together and not just, just before the tournament, but they would have been meeting for the last six months, going through briefing material, coming to agreements and consensus on what they're about to do in these situations. And this may well have been a topic of conversation. I don't know. I wasn't there, but it's something that I cover in my briefings when I'm briefing towards tournaments. So I would certainly think so. Mike, you think it should be a red card, but functionally in that match, it was the same thing as he looks like he gives a 10 minute yell. Yeah, it is. It is. But this is about the principle, right? Because I don't want you to think all of you in all of these other jurisdictions that because it was given as a 10 minute yellow here, that you're going to do that when it happens in the second quarter of your match in your local comp, please don't. 
Okay. Um, let's see. Your your opinion is going to be biased on whatever the KNHB wants, which you think differs from the international way. Yes, because you might have different regulations that somehow change the way that the rules of hockey should be applied. Yeah, and it was. Um, let's see. The rules say you can't show the same color card to the uh, to the player twice, but you don't like it. I like it. I like it because it means that you don't have discretion in this. And too many of you aren't grab, aren't seeing this moment and, say, and feeling that this player shouldn't play anymore. Feeling. That's what you should be thinking. This player is not entitled to come back into this game. End of story. KNHB wants the red card here, just like with the player not being allowed to get two greens. Two greens is a yellow card, and a second yellow is a first, showing the yellow card and then a red card, which the English call a technical red. Absolutely. Scott, you've only given two yellow cards to the same player in the past, but one was for breaking down play, and the other was dissent being rude to officials, a form of misconduct. So that that is where I think you have the chance. When you When you start thinking about it, the same argument, it's, Mm, I don't know. Did you unintentionally spark this week's rant? I don't think anybody, oh no, that's true. Everybody tries to trigger me into a rant. You're right. Uh, no problem. Scott, we definitely wouldn't give a green card for violence if there's only one minute left in the game, it has to be red. Yeah, another another good analogy. Like, let's not think that just, you know, just because it has the same functional effect with that 10 minute yellow that that means that you shouldn't be giving a red card for it. There you go. I, yeah, I, sh I sure hope that I'm funny enough to be an online comedy gig. I'm kind of insulted that Ian's going to something that he deems to be funnier than this. I'm just kidding. Red card for David because he's on board with the program. Here's our two minute warning and just clarify. It's one of those very rare, rare, rare moments. Um, I'm just gonna pull up the result. 80% of you wanted the yellow card is enough. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think very long and hard about this moment because I, I don't like it. I don't like it. Where's the, sorry, I'm trying to find the result now. There it is. I'm surprised. I'm surprised at how overwhelming this is in the other way you have not been watching my rants often enough about this topic okay mishy meister gave um oh no sorry oh can i just squirrel there we go that's the sound effect i really should have had shut that down sorry you went the right way on this one i got caught up and confused because I'm tired. Yes, in this particular one moment, two yellow cards is fine. Okay. What will effectively happen for this player once they have their meeting with the TD and they will, because this is actually, I think, I think he took a yellow card in the, in the first game, uh, that he played. Who did Chile play? Um, was it France? Yes. And so there will undoubtedly be a meeting and the player is going to need to explain just how he's not going to be doing anything like that again. So um, it's not that there aren't consequences at the international level for the two yellow cards being given there absolutely are and players can be uh awarded match bans for accumulating too many yellow cards it's not the same as in a sport ball world cup where there's an automatic suspension automatic this automatic that 
You can see how automatic of anything like that administratively gets you into trouble because then you can have outsized penalties being imposed for future matches without the discretion that's available to a tournament director, organizer, whatever it is in sport ball. I don't know. I don't care. So having that available is, I think, something that helps hockey do the right thing when it comes to players and their misconduct. So there you go. Um, the big takeaway, are those two things separate enough? You're considering the red, but you're considering the separation of the two incidents. And that's, yeah, and I, I appreciate that. That's exactly what you want to be doing and thinking about. Are they so different that, you know, you really can invite this player to partake in the match again, potentially? Does a red card have an effect of beyond the game? It would be reviewed. Then a red and a yellow, yellow are not technically equal. Um, th and and yeah, that's that's another point. But I've seen red cards uh, given at international level and no match ban being imposed afterwards. And I've seen red cards with a one match ban and a two match ban and more than that of a match ban depending on the offense. And that's why we do things good. Okay. You're happy enough. And Jeanette has only given a tech red. I've given, what have I said in the past? I don't remember. Four? Three? Three, four? I've only given one, two, three straight reds. So there you go. Okay, where are we at now? How are we doing? Oh, yes. The social media scandal of the day. Too many players on the pitch. Let's have it. Defender. Had it landed over the defender, then yes, the advantage was for the attacker, but that was within his reach. So rightly so by Empire. We are Empire. at the last two minutes. Exactly spot on two minutes, two minutes left in the game. Available between Korea and Japan and Japan pulls their goalkeeper. I'm pausing this because I want you to watch. I went back to the video. I didn't see it at the time. Okay. I did not see it at the time. Which way should I go? I didn't see it at the time. Many people did not. Adam Commons was at the game. He was in the stands. He took a picture. He put it on Twitter. He took it down off Twitter, probably because he got in a little bit of shit for talking smack about stuff. But let me see this. This might be a little difficult, but okay. So we have one, two, three right here in the picture. Oh, I didn't want to clear it. One, two, three. Let's play it just a little bit. Jagbeer, take off their Four. Goalkeeper Dom Dixon. Five, six, seven. Early in the game as a tactic to try and shock the Netherlands. It didn't work. This is a different scenario. This is 148 left for Japan. Yes. It worked when I counted them before. But as, if you count as they move. They're real genuine chances. Okay, that was a sub with the bib. It might come really clear here. My screen isn't updating the way it needs to be. Four, five, six, seven, eight. But, uh... To shock the opponents, uh, I think that was the time when his team conceded one goal also. When he... Now we have nine, ten, whoops, nine, ten on the edge of the screen. Move the goalkeeper. Eleven down here. Twelve just popped in the screen. Okay. At the moment... <laughs> 
That's very messy. At the moment that they pulled the goalkeeper off the pitch, that's when the incorrect sub occurred. They play the whole two minutes of this, and you can count them again as you're going through. Okay, there are 12 Japanese players on the pitch even now. Such neat handwriting. It's really hard to do this. Look at how crowded it is. I remember thinking, man, it's really crowded. But then it's extremely apparent here, right? I mean, it's... It's very obvious once it's been pointed out to you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve. It's a North American thing. So this is not the responsibility of the umpires. As we've talked about at other tournaments whenever this has happened, this is a technical table issue. And this is why whenever you make exceptions to substitution rules, like a goalkeeper can step off the pitch at the side instead of at the center line where everybody else does, that's when things go wrong. Because as you see in a couple more seconds when the next substitution occurs, the field players are exchanging bibs and that helps them keep it straight. It used to be that you had to hold a player's like number up and that just got really unnecessary complicated. Players who are not on the pitch and who are on the sideline are supposed to be wearing bibs, but at least if they're holding them, you have an indication, okay, that player isn't responsible. There's the bib, ex bib exchange <laughs> right there. But when a goalkeeper steps off, what must have happened in that moment that we can't see is that as the goalkeeper's traveling off, two players went on, and it wasn't glaringly obvious for the tech table to track. You can bet that they're not going to make this mistake again in this tournament, but these mistakes, unfortunately, they do happen. And they happen even at this level. So let's see what's happening here. Yeah, you can see all the 12 on the screen. And so what's going to happen, especially I'm sure that the TD has gone back to check everything. And even if it was only for the end of time PCs and not only like it was the whole two minutes, the whole last two minutes. And I'm sure the TD's seen it all is that the captain is going to receive a match ban for this. Um, when Argentina was discovered having done it in during the bronze medal game at the 2014 World Cup, Argentina took a, the captain had to serve a match ban, but I think it, I think it was more than one match, but I could be wrong. It's, it was eight years ago. And he served them when Argentina played some test matches against Chile in the next like six months after that served them. So he didn't play against Chile. And back then Chile was really, really bad. So it totally didn't matter. Okay. So Raju, I want to. I want to help you with something. You're new to our community, but what we don't do is we don't use language like this. We do not judge, insult, or drag umpires or technical officials. It is okay to point out that they've made a mistake. It's okay to say that something is a poor decision. I have no problem with that, but we don't use that kind of language here. Okay, because we are all officials. We are all trying to do our best to serve the game. And we're here to support each other, to learn, to improve, and to grow. Okay? Thank you. Didn't change the result. That's obviously a very positive thing. Um, and you've been in MO when 12 players won. You didn't notice, but the team did and quickly took the player off. Yeah, and, and what they're doing at international levels, Simon, and this is something that maybe you need to talk to your region about, talk to England hockey too, and things like that as to whether you would still award a card to the captain. So let's say 
there have been moments where it has been caught, where the team has tried to put too many players on the pitch. They haven't even restarted the game and they've had too many players because maybe there was a card. Uh, I remember this happened in Argentina's Pro League leg that just occurred. And it was the beginning of a quarter and they didn't know, they didn't know, Germany didn't know that Ruhr had taken a card at the end of the third quarter. They started the fourth quarter with 11. And before the first whistle even went, a yellow card was given to the captain. And they were like, oh, how, what? We haven't even started play yet, but they're clearly the intention was, and especially because the time restarts straight two minutes, no delays, no whatever. They were clearly intending to start with too many players on the pitch. So the yellow card had to be given. They hated it. They didn't love that decision at all. So that's okay, Raju. I'm glad you're here. Okay. And, and this, I'm here to, to make all of us better in this. And sometimes it means that I have to point out your mistake as well. And you wouldn't be here, especially after all this time, you've been hanging for an hour and a half. You clearly want to learn and you want to be a part of this place. And I appreciate that. I'm so excited about that. So this isn't, you know, but everybody knows this is a very firm rule in my world and I enforce it. So thank you for that. And I appreciate you reaching back out. Hard for any umpire to spot where there is no MO. You're interested in umpire strategies to check as the game is progressing. I think that what we can do when it's our responsibility, one of the ways that we might keep better track of this is that in big moments, like when a goalkeeper does come off, don't restart time until you've done a count. So do a count when you card. Do a count when, you sub a goal, when a team subs a goalkeeper off in order to play with more players. And... Th those are the times and otherwise it's player off player on player off player on and and you're watching that something that I do in my local league is with my team I bring bibs even though we don't use them for anything else because we barely ever train I bring the bibs and I have them on the bench and I I make my players do the subs with the bibs and they're like Keely this is stupid and I said yeah let's do it anyway because I believe in doing little things like that that make umpires' jobs easier and make my job as a manager, coach, easier. And just as that layer of professionalism. So that's how I do it. Uh, we all make, make mistakes. Uh, wouldn't be too harsh on the TDs here. As Toby said in the podcast, They the teams have to have responsibility. It's up to, you know, it's for everyone to own and learn from. Yeah. And it's, 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 I mean, I haven't been a technical official very much. I've stepped in a few times and, and done it. And it's one of those things that you think this is the easiest in the world. This is the easiest shit in the world. Like who can't do this? You're a pencil pusher. You're whatever. And we, we all think this as umpires to never make a mistake on your stopwatch on the scoreboard on recording players and their names and whether there's a goal and et cetera, making sure that the substitutions are done correctly. Never making a single mistake is way harder than it sounds. We know that we go out there as umpires and we make all kinds of mistakes and we're like, yep, that's how it goes. We're trying to, we're trying to reduce them. We're trying to do this as, as well as possible, but we're making mistakes. They don't get to make any because it's clear when they do. The only thing I can say about this is I'm really glad it didn't happen in a game that involved India because we know what happens, right? Indian Twitter gets really, really mad. And Raju, yes, we have a term around here called Indian Twitter because had this happened during an India match, there would have been uproar. This has happened in a match that didn't involve India and their fans. So yeah, we're all talking about it and blah, 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 but there's no calls for anybody's heads. So keep that in mind. The way that we discuss these issues needs to be level-headed. It needs to be constructive and it needs to be with a view of trying to eliminate it from happening again. That's it. 
That's all we can do. Uh, Keely, this is stupid. Wait, wait till I get a yellow. Yeah, wait till my ca captain takes a, a card for having too many players on the pitch. Uh, counting the subs is quicker than checking numbers on the pitch, except if a sub has gone off for a bathroom break. If a sub has ducked around, um, if you it, a sub has ducked around the dugout because they're dealing with a shoe or equipment issue or something like that. So it's a little harder than you think. What if somebody's gone to the hospital with an injury? What if, what if, what if? As an MO, you missed recording a goal. There was much discussion after a goal and a yellow card was issued. While dealing with the yellow card, you missed that they'd actually awarded a goal. Seems easy, but it's a lot harder in that moment because you know that you are the last resort. You know you are it. And Luke, yes, you are spending a lot of time on the TD bench. And the TO can be managing a number of things at one time, timing cards, calming managers, watching subs go on and off. There is a lot to do. There is. So let's just keep that in mind. I just wish that they didn't either. Okay. Um, last note that I'd like to, oh, and so I covered off what the consequences would be for the team and yes, the captain will, will be serving a ban. I am undoubtedly, I am sure of, uh, I'll go find it somewhere. It'll be buried somewhere on the FIH site where nobody can find it. I hate that. It's so it makes me so angry. But the last thing I wanted to draw your attention to is a hockey PC. It is not anything about a penalty corner, but this is a podcast that the good people at de belgique what is it called de, de belgique pod simon i know you know what the the full title is um so flores Hertz and toby walter and a couple other guys whose names i've now forgotten are doing a daily podcast from the world cup it's very good it's very good i would suggest all of you to uh take it in if you go to at the hockey, the hockey PC with the underscores in there, the underscore hockey underscore PC on Instagram. You can click through their links or you can look up the podcast in your favorite podcast player. You can find it on Spotify, but I don't use Spotify. I use Overcast and that's where it is. So, um, Flores tagged me on the Chris Ruhr kiss. And if you hadn't seen the Chris Ruhr kiss, please, Christopher Ruhr kiss, please go and, and have a look. It was one of the topics I could have talked about today, but I ran out of time. Germany and Belgium game, it was, it was quite the set too. It was quite the thing. And uh, Ruhr um, did a very Ruhr thing and took a yellow card for pushing a Belgian player over. I don't think the Belgian player was as injured as maybe they were trying to make him out to be at the moment, but the, it was just very clear. It was just a, you know, unnecessary physical play breaking down at that moment of the game and a really stupid thing to do. And then of course, because there's so much you could, the mics were picking up everything that was coming from the Belgian bench and they were really upset and they were trying to get even more out of it than I think perhaps they deserved. And Ruhr being Ruhr, he's sitting there on the suspension chair and he goes, mm, you know, you'll see it on the Instagram. And some people love that. They think it's fun. It's fun for hockey. It's hilarious. It's sassy. It's whatever. And it's Ruhr being Ruhr. I, I mean, I sure hope. I sure hope that he, you know, doesn't miss any other goals because he sure missed a few opportunities in that game. And if he keeps letting his team down, I don't know, that kind of stuff, that, that comes back to haunt you. It really does. But the other thing that they're doing is they, they do spend some time in the podcast talking about umpiring decisions. They seem to be really struggling with the aerial interception rules. And I'm, I've offered out my services if they want to talk to me about any particular thing. They also often talk about the number of video referrals. And this was a question that came as well um, I should have had it out here and I, I didn't, 
I might be able to bring it really quickly onto the pit, onto the screen here. This came through on Twitter from Ian, a uh, longtime follower of FH Empires. Thank you very much, Ian, always. And he was asking about the broad theme of too many referrals in the Hockey World Cup. And the one thing that the guys at the Hockey BC didn't, uh, don't seem to quite understand is that umpires do not take self-referrals for penalty corner decisions. They can only take them for penalty strokes and goals. And there have been zero instances of umpires in this World Cup or any time else taking a self-referral for a penalty corner decision. End of story, zero stop. If you can't, if you don't understand how referrals work and where they're coming from, ask me, but they, I swear there has been none. And I've watched every minute of every game that's happened so far in this world cup. When the umpire does this motion, or if you're Kuhn, you do this with your fist, that's a T sign. And that indicates team doesn't mean timeout. It says team. That means it's a team referral. When an umpire does this, that's a self referral. Me, I'm taking it self. Okay. Very, <laughs> very basic stuff here. There have been no self referrals for penalty corner decisions. And the match that a lot of people were talking about was the England Wells match that we took a few things and her man was really under it. He took a, he got referred and overturned a lot. A lot of decisions were just really difficult that he wasn't in, you know, because of where the players were, wasn't an angle to see things in all fairness to him. So not taking that, but working through aerial interceptions, talking about the number of referrals and things like that. One thing they're doing is Toby is nominating an umpire of the day. So the umpire he thinks has had the best performance, I think is really cute. So this I think is the list. So on day one, he picked Jakub day two wraps on day three, Marson. And that was in the England, um, the England India game. And I, you know, I, I agree with Jakub's nomination on day one and Sean, you know, uh, had, had a really good game on day two as well. Marson absolutely on day three Lim on day four. Yeah. He's been very, very good on the pitch, very accurate. And then day five, they gave it to Javid cause in the booth, he, he did a very good job. He had a couple of big referrals and did them very well. It didn't take very long. So it's very cute. Have a, have a listen, have a listen. And you'll, you'll hear more about what top coaches and players in the world are looking at and what their perspective is on not just the match, but on umpiring decisions. So I recommend it. And yeah, Flores friend, I'm right here. Give me a call. I can help. There you go. It's dangerous to make a self-referral, says Jolt. Ha! I know, right? And and it's it can be confusing. It can be confusing, but I think it's better than going <laughs> or and if anybody screenshots that, I'm gonna kick your ass. Or something like this. Like there's there's not a lot of gestures out there that we can use for a self-referral that are gonna look good. Uh Thank you, Scott, for that. Let's see. Luke, your opinion is you, we have one of the better referral systems in sports, and I agree. Okay. And Dan made a very good self-referral on a goal award. Yes, Steve did another one on a penalty stroke. Very good. I think the, you know, it's difficult when you have a number of referrals in a game because it means that an umpire isn't getting stuff right. And I hate to see that, but it's a fact of life. It's, it's the way it goes. And, um, the, the, the times that a self-referral should be taken have, have almost always been taken. The only time we had a question was in the Australia Argentina game. And I didn't clip it cause I didn't have time, but there was a clear foot, uh, close to the goal line by an Argentinian player. And the players were asking for a referral but Martin had already called a free hit for the defense before. And a lot of people didn't see it. I didn't see it at first until I realized watching the replay that Martin had two arms up and he was, he was doing, and this is where you can't, 
you can't use two arms because it gets confusing. But he was showing with his right arm that thing that happened over there, that stick obstruction before the ball hit the foot is a free hit out. That's the way I saw it. I could be wrong, but that's, that's what I perceived there. And so that was the only time that I thought maybe a self-referral could have helped. But uh, no, Niels, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. And let's see. Okay, I think that's most of the stuff that we had. It was your first time today. I'm glad. I'm glad you learned a lot. And please feel free to pop into our Discord server and you'll find more friends in there. And uh, I would love to have more uh, hockey friends from all over the place. There's way too many England people. I'm not English. I don't need to have all these England people in there. I love you all still, but can we, can we spice it up? Can we get some diversity going? It'd be, it'd be fun. So pop into the server and, and have a chat with us because we'd love your perspective. And Stain, yes, all right. See, this is, this is where knowing people helps. And I've, D I've DM'd Flores too, so we'll see what happens. Thank you for popping in, everybody. I really appreciate all of your time. And we're only 12 minutes over. That's pretty good for five days of a Hockey World Cup. We're obviously going to have two more shows wrapping up all the Hockey World Cup action uh, over the next two weeks. But there you go. <laughs> it's Tim Corver. <laughs> and um, yes, here's the names of all the other people. Uh, it's met, uh, Toby Walter, uh, the ex-Dutch or the ex-German player, uh, Karen from, from uh, Gantois, or Kevin from Gantois, Pascal Kina, Antoine Kina's father. I think it's a joke. I don't know for sure, but it sounds like it's a joke. And Flores Gertz. Kurtz. There you go. And the Britishness intensifies. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I love you all. I really do. Okay. Thanks for coming by. Enjoy the rest of your hockey week. See you in the server. Lots of watch parties to come. Keep being awesome out there.